Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the School of the Arts at the University of Liverpool and this public lecture by Beatrice Garcia. My name is Peter Buse, and I'm the Dean of the School of the Arts. This evening, we're taking care of some unfinished business. On March the 18th of this year, Beatrice was due to give the concluding lecture in our 2020 program with the title, Every City Tells a Story, The Hype and Legacy of Event-Led Cultural Regeneration. Well, we know what happened next, but we're finally back in a new venue and with a new title because we're adapting to the times. This series of talks uh, in which this is a concluding uh, talk was united by a theme, Beauty Utility Time, which uh, already had presentations by our colleagues in architecture, in English, in music and philosophy before COVID shut us down and shut the series down. One of the aims of this, this series, which we run every year in the School of the Arts, is to reach out into Liverpool, particularly into the wider city, to find a, a bigger audience than just an academic one. And we've been very successful in that, not only drawing colleagues from disciplines other than our own, but also right, right around the, the city of, of Liverpool. And it's very important for our, uh, our mission of cultural engagement to do that. And while there are many drawbacks, obviously, uh, to the situation that we find ourselves in at the moment, uh, that we can't meet in person, um, we can't hold a wine reception, which is very disappointing. Uh, one of the great parts of these events uh, is the socializing um, afterwards. But one major benefit um, of the situation we're in is that we can reach a much wider audience. And this evening, we have people visiting us, obviously, from the, from the university, but we also have attendees not only from around Liverpool, but in fact, um, from all around the world, and especially from arts and cultural organizations. So you're all really very welcome. It's great to have you here in our virtual uh, lecture. Um, and just before I introduce Beatrice, I'd like to say thank you especially to Helen Thomas and everyone in uh, the events team in the School of the Arts for, for making this, this happen and reorganizing this event in this, in this way. So um, just before I introduce Beatrice, I'll just say a little bit about the format uh, of the, the talk tonight. Beatrice is gonna speak um, for about 30 minutes or, or so. And then after Beatrice is, has spoken, we're going to have a, a discussion with uh, two uh, panelists um, who will join us, uh, Sean McCarthy and Philippe Blanchard. Um, and that will go on for another 15, 20 minutes. And then we'll receive questions um, from the floor. So if you use the, the Q&A function, um, when we come to that, then we'll be able to go through your questions and read them out uh, and the panel will, will, will answer them. Um, and we've had two in advance, two questions in advance, and I think um, uh, Beatrice is going to in fact answer um, them as she goes, she goes along, but we'll come to them uh, at, the, at the end as well. So um, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Beatrice Garcia. She's a senior lecturer in cultural policy and media events at the University of Liverpool. She's a member of the Culture and Olympic Heritage Commission, nominated by the International Olympic Committee, and a member of the European Capital of Culture Selection Committee, nominated by the European Commission. She's the former director of the Institute of Cultural Capital and founder of the Cities of Culture Research Observatory. Beatrice has been at the forefront of research on the rhetoric, impact, and long-term legacy of major events since 1999. She's conducted fieldwork on the cultural impact of every edition of the Olympic Games since Sydney 2000 and directed the largest evaluation of a Games cultural program for London 2012, becoming the point of reference for Tokyo 2020 and Paris 2024. Beatrice also directed the only study on the 30 year legacy of the European Capital of Culture program for the European Parliament and directed the pioneering Impacts 08 program, a 20 year program on the socioeconomic and cultural impacts of Liverpool as European capital of culture. So Beatrice, I'm handing over to you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Peter. And it's a real pleasure to be here and finally have the opportunity uh, to deliver this lecture. It's also fantastic to see the, the upside of uh, meeting digitally as uh, we are able just to reach out to a very uh, large and diverse audience that probably are not in the evening, might be in the, in the morning or in the afternoon. So uh, hello to all of you. And I can see 
that we keep being joined in by, uh, by people as we go along. But there is plenty uh, I want to, to share with you. So I will um, go straight into, into the questions. And this really important question that is, what is the future of really, really large interventions and uh, mega events? I would like to start by sharing with you the responses that we received to the couple of questions that we pass on uh, in advance, um, where we were wondering about the top words, the top associations you had when thinking of mega events and about your level of agreement or disagreement with a series of statements. And it is fascinating to see uh, how this kind of world clouds uh, get composed. I don't know how much you can see. Obviously, this is automated and it's not a very scientific exercise. Um, so the range of words that are used, even if they are similar, they will appear uh, in different corners. But you can see, obviously, the term Olympic Games emerging very clearly alongside references to crowds, to people, but also to cost, you know, whether a mega event is about high expense. Also references to culture and to legacy. And as you kept responding, the cloud kept evolving and we keep having these different tensions, these different angles around the mega event, whether it's wasteful, overwhelming, whether there is corruption uh, with these kinds of initiatives. At the same time, whether it's about the ooh factor, um, the notion of being transcendental, uh, whether it is life enhancing or whether it's ostentatious. So we have all of these uh, different reactions, at times something that we might feel simultaneously in the context of a mega event. We also asked of, well, of you, how did you agree with these uh, types of statements? Again, not very scientific. Uh, but interesting uh, to get the sense of, uh, well, how it's, it's not easy to think either in black or in white about mega events. It's clear that the kind of statements most of you would highly agree with have to do with the impact uh, that large scale interventions might have on the sense of, of local pride and on the projection of images of place. And this is very important to this lecture because at the same time as talking about the mega event phenomenon, uh, what interests me and what has been at the heart of my work for the last uh, 20 years is also the role of the city. Uh, so the specific place where these interventions uh, occur. Then you have also reactions to the other side and is whether mega events might encourage narratives that are actually unrepresentative, maybe oversimplified, even divisive in some cases. Uh, and to the question of whether they bring communities together, you tend to agree, uh, but it's not really something that is as, as obvious for everyone to confirm. Obviously, there are concerns as well, I would expect, with whether events might also uh, lead to divisions or to exclusions. And the most interesting is also the fact that in terms of agreement and disagreement, most of you would feel equally uh, about the notion that a mega event might help grow an urban economy, but at the same time might impose unsustainable economic uh, pressures. Now we will have other opportunities for interaction with you whilst I speak. So for those of you that have any phones nearby, just other devices beyond the screen you are using to see this presentation, this may be the easiest way for you to respond to some questions. Otherwise, obviously, you can also do uh, with a single device, but maybe uh, having to open a browser. I will explain you about this just a bit later. Before, I would like to tell you uh, a bit more about the background uh, to my work and to our discussion today, and also encourage you to think about this image you are seeing here. It's like a kind of quiz question for you. Uh, I can reveal that obviously, yes, is an image from an opening ceremony of an Olympic Games edition. And as you can see, the choice of lighting of the cauldron is one of the symbolic you know, grand moments for the opening of an Olympic Games was done by a Paralympic athlete, an archer, that fired uh, an arrow. So maybe you can, if you want to guess what city did this, can be interesting to hear. I will tell you now in a, in a moment uh, the answer. Um, well, I'm originally from, from Spain, and my first 
experience of a mega event was with the World Cup in 1982. I was a seven year old at the time. And the most direct impact that this uh, mega event moment had on me was that my parents finally bought an actual television to have at home. Uh, when I was born, our previous TV was, was dropped and they never replaced it. But when the World Cup came to Spain, it was just certainly no question of delaying this purchase any further. So I had to wait until the 1982 uh, football uh, cup in order to watch cartoons at home like any other of my, of my friends. It was an event that really marked uh, the start of a conversation around Spain and uh, you know, the imagery such as the poster was at the heart of a lot of narrative developments for, for the country. Something that was furthered with the Olympic Games in 1992, hosted in Barcelona. And yes, it was Barcelona, the, the host uh, of the ceremonies uh, that involved uh, an arrow to light uh, the cauldron. It was also uh, the city that pushed forward this notion that is that beyond watching the sport and beyond getting coverage on the medals, and, uh, and what happens within the stadia, the city should equally be a protagonist of an Olympic Games. It also presented the mascot Kobe that became very well known. And in parallel to this, uh, we also had another uh, mega event happening in 1992 that was the World Expo in Sevilla that also myself and my family went uh, to visit. It was an interesting year for Spain. We had Olympics, World Expo, and also the European uh, capital of culture titled the EU initiative uh, that was hosted in Madrid. Important the impact that this combination of mega events had again on narratives of place and representation. How often during the 90s we had these different mascots being combined and put together to talk about this Marca España, no? the Spanish brand, and a new narrative of a new contemporary uh, country a democratic country after Franco, a place that had much more than just, you know, the, the sangria or the siesta or the flamenco that was very diverse. Uh, so again, the mega event experience contributing to imageries. And this became uh, a very popular way of representing the country internationally. So the poster by Joan Miró uh, in the uh, 82 um, World Cup being transformed into a kind of brand and imagery for the country from 1983 onwards. Now, let's think of what is a mega event. So when we're thinking about the degree of, of impact and transformation capacity that these initiatives have, how do they differ from festivals or from other types of events? It's a question that became quite popular within academic circles precisely in the 1980s and the 1990s, many authors trying to debate uh, definitions, a scale, and as recently as 2015, we had another attempt uh, by Martin Miller to define what is distinctive about the mega event. And the first and core notion, according to Miller, was this idea of size. It's really about scale. And he would argue that is something that could be captured, argued, and articulated mainly through quantitative means, by looking into numbers, large-scale numbers. A mega event attracts really large volumes of visitors, of ticket holders attending events, a minimum of half a million or up to three million uh, visitors or attendees. It has global mediated reach and can sell uh, in the case of Miller, he would argue, is about the selling of, uh, of media rights, the rights for broadcasting, that also could go into the, the billions of, um, of dollars. And so this that we have, oh, little alarms popping. We have, he also would talk about cost and uh, the idea that any mega event can be costing from the nature of one to 10 billion uh, US dollars. And in terms of impact, he would refer to the notion of transformation specifically. It was mainly calculated as well from an economic point of view in terms of capital investments. And like this, we would then distinguish different categories at the very top level, having clearly uh, the Olympic Games, the World Cup, 
the World Expo um, uh, for many years, at the level of the Hallmark event, they would argue that is more the types of events that are associated with a specific city, events such as the Edinburgh Festival, the Carnival in Rio, and so on. But what is clear is that it seems that a lot of this debate has been about articulating um, what we could know as sporting events. The mega event discussion, most of these authors would relate it with, with that. Myself, in my uh, research, in my studies, in my publications, I have been trying to argue a parallel conversation. And is that when we talk about mega events, yes, size matters, but we should also try to understand, document and articulate significance. And that this can be symbolic significance. So also the value and the importance of the intangible dimensions that cannot be quantified in the same way but also explain what is transformative, what is memorable, and actually what is meaningful about these experiences. So in the same way that we are talking about visitor numbers, what is important about the mega event experience is also the kind of engagement that people have, the intensity, the quality of the connection, how memories get created, for how long do they last? how much they contribute to that defining identity or to actually disrupting uh, or generating also activism and contestation. Uh, we are talking about mediated reach and how much uh, different channels of so television, media companies might be ready to pay. Also, I think what is important is the diversity of national bases for such media coverage. How many nations are following simultaneously an event? from how many different places are those uh, visitors and those uh, direct participants, competitors, contributors. We're talking about cost. We should also talk about value and cultural value at that. And if we are talking about impact, it should not only be from an economic uh, perspective, we also should be able to capture and understand the impact that these events might have on, on image, on narrative, on conversations. And this takes us to also to then understanding and maybe appreciating that there is a whole range of other types of events on the arts and cultural sphere that in some way might be getting close so it could also be articulated as mega events. So before I continue, it would be useful to get a sense of, of who you are. It's really frustrating for me that I cannot see faces. So what we have is a couple of questions for you. Um, I will stop sharing uh, this screen and ask my colleague Helen to share another screen that is taking us to this um, Mentimeter environment. Now, if you have another device or access to the browser and you simply type menti.com and then insert this code, the 33910007, you will be directed straight away into this question. And uh, yes, so let's see. I'm asking about cities just to see. I mean, we could have many towns and many villages. So it's useful to get a sense, yes, of uh, how many, more of how many places, all right. And also the international take is great. It's fantastic to see this evolving. <laughs> Very good. Oh, fantastic. And we have Frederic joining us from Lausanne. Fantastic also to see. Um, so we have, yes, International Olympic Committee uh, colleagues um, joining us. So we will give it a bit more time for this to uh, show up and evolve before we move into the next uh, question. Fant oh, we have Auckland as well. Fantastic to see the diversity Vienna. Uh, we have Krakow. So I think let's let it evolve. But as we are pressed for time, and we will look back later to see how many places. So yes, maybe Helen, if we can go into the, the next question. And at the end, I will try to share as well the final world of our cities. Now what you can is choose the events that you find most exciting. And again, I could have asked more about meaningful, um, but yes, interesting to see. I have decided also to include the kind of odd one out, yes, things like Eurovision, that 
have never been debated as a mega event per se, but actually I think have the right, have earned the right. Uh, fascinating to see major art festivals and how they accumulate your responses at the same time as the Olympic Games or the European Capital of Culture program that has been again growing in significance uh, within the EU and also is little by little earning the right to get into the mega event category perhaps, especially during opening during their opening ceremonies because also of the influence that is having in other parts of the world where similar initiatives are uh, being developed. Let's leave it there, Helen, thank you. Uh, so very useful to get these responses from you. Right, so let's move on and then see about the types of mega events that we have grown used to. And here we have another image that you can try to get a, a guess of what it is from, what uh, opening ceremony um, presented this extraordinary collection of drummers. When we talk about mega events, the period of time that uh, has been key is particularly the last 40 years. So starting in the 1980s onwards. And the cities that I have worked most closely uh, with, or that I will present a few findings with you now, are these ones here. So Barcelona, Sydney, and London. I have worked with every city since 2000, but we would have no time to, to share all the findings today. Again, in parallel to that, we have the European Capital of Culture program that is developing spin-offs around the world, so in, in the Americas. We also have them in Africa, in Southeast Asia. So developing, growing in size, and the cities that I have explored, and I will share a few uh, views uh, with you, is are Glasgow and Liverpool. Uh, but obviously now we get into 2020 and the disruption to, to the development of, uh, of the cycles. Uh, Tokyo being postponed into 2021. Galway and Rijeka that were supposed to be hosting European Capital of Culture having to reinvent, rethink uh, their whole concept and other types of, of, event, as, of events such as the Edinburgh Festival being cancelled uh, this August and the Expo as well. So it was supposed to be happening in Dubai and our panelists are actually representing uh, these two uh, type of events or so have strong connections with them so they might tell us a bit more about this uh, later. But let me tell you a bit about the cities, the cities that have been transformed by mega events. And I might have to rush uh, a few of the slides uh, because again, as time keeps uh, flowing very quickly, uh, I want to make sure I can get to the second part of my presentation that is also about the way mega events have been transformed by cities. Uh, but let's start with the city's stories. And, and again, my hometown, Barcelona, with one of these images that has become iconic and is uh, very telling uh, about what was achieved, what was innovative uh, at that point in 1992. It was this opportunity to make sure that the media coverage, the story about these games was as much about the sports and about the podium as about the city and the context, the place where these games were taking place. And what was very clever in terms of the city or the, the games organizers was to have ideas such as this, not to have one of the sporting venues on top of a hill. This is the swimming pool where the diving was taking place. So that when the photographers were taking the pics of, of the athletes uh, jumping, they would also have the, the skyline alongside it. Not the Sagrada Familia that you can guess at the end. But this, this didn't happen by chance. The opportunity for a city to take such center stage uh, and take an almost uh, steal the show at times, uh, be part of the conversation. It was a result of more than a decade um, working and rethinking uh, the, the urban planning, the development of the city, but also the symbolic uh, narrative and the way of engaging uh, the local community, the residents. With a campaign such as this one, was the idea of Barcelona, pretty up, get beautiful, make yourself beautiful, encouraging everyone to put flowers on their balconies, to upgrade and redo their facades. They also approach in terms of hosting the games and having a very ambitious public art program alongside it. Uh, the fact of obviously using the opportunity of the games to advance 
really long delay uh, aspirations such as reconnecting the city with its waterfront. As so many other port cities, Barcelona had its back to, to the sea because it was an area associated with danger in the previous centuries. So here we have for the first time the beach uh, experience being seen as part of a city center experience for, for Barcelona. And obviously then the idea, the approach, the engagement in using the mascot, the merchandise and the promotion of the games in a way that was presenting a very clear and distinct notion of, of graphic design of the character uh, of that city with a mascot Kobe that kept living a life far beyond the Olympic Games, would keep appearing and being part of the conversation uh, until much later, including now. And again, this is not something, don't really quote me too much with this, it's a bit of a dark side of the, of the, the humor, but I just found this. I'm sure that the designer Mariscal was not involved on it, but this kind of, uh, yeah, dark humor reacting on a year like this, which is simply evidence of how well known the Kobe mascot is and how everyone in Spain or in Barcelona would get this, uh, this kind of yeah, ironic twist on, on what we are experiencing this year. Here we have another city that was transformed by a mega event and well, or a major event at the time, uh, which was the European Capital of Culture program and a place like Glasgow that was the very first city to host the title without actually being well known or celebrated already as a European center or a center of culture. It was a city with a really deep image problems, particularly in the UK, associated with, with violence, with decay, with economic decline. But it made the case about the value of having an event, a cultural event, in order to turn around the narrative and to celebrate everything that it had and that probably was, that was not known uh, sufficiently. Uh, again, the approach was to start many years before, so in 1983, with a very ambitious and at that point uh, avant-garde or advanced city marketing campaign. It was not very common uh, back then for cities uh, to have marketing uh, uh, approaches, but there you go, it was inspired by the uh, New York and the I Love New York uh, campaign from the late uh, 70s. And again, the development and the presentation of work with this um, European Capital of Culture opportunity in terms of celebrating the architecture, uh, the design of uh, reconnecting with uh, well known people in the city like Charles Rennie McIntosh and trying to develop those associations in ways that have kept developing for many years to come. So, again, a city that had not tourism economy to speak of back in the 80s managing to transform itself and on the back of, of an event, uh, putting culture at its center, becoming clearly another leading tourism center in, in Scotland, but also throughout the UK, a hub for the creative industries. Barcelona had this image. Sydney is the other city I wanted to speak to you about uh, briefly. Um, and the games in 2000 that again, were very much connected to this urban environment. And what the games allowed uh, Sydney to do and Australia at the time was also advance a little known narrative about yeah, the contemporary arts, about the urban hubs in Australia, uh, beyond the outback, beyond the kangaroos, no? how there is so much more that could be uh, celebrated. The city used very much its famous icons in terms of, of connecting with the, with the sport competitions, but also advance what now has become at the very heart of hosting a mega event up until the time of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, which was this idea of live sites, of putting large screens uh, throughout the city so that people could watch and follow the sport together gathering in a joint celebration. So not just from their TVs, isolated at home, but actually as part of a communal experience. It was very well managed in Sydney and since then has become expected. And is where one of the big questions is, what is the future of, of life sites post 2020? Again, ambitious cultural programs and uh, opportunities to use the games to advance narratives of connection, of multiculturalism, the celebration of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities as communities that are alive, that keep innovating and are not just 
fixed in the past. No, uh, here is the Bangara uh, Dance uh, Theatre Company that became quite internationally renowned on, on the wake of those Olympics. And briefly on Liverpool, again, the second city to host a European capital of culture in the UK. Uh, this happened in 2008. And again, it was a surprise winner. It was not expected that the title would come to Liverpool. It is a place that had also a real uh, profoundly uh, troubling image problems, especially in this country, in, in the UK, and that used uh, the opportunity to try to diversify and to expand on the narrative. What was very important about uh, what Liverpool did and the approach to, uh, to making the most of the European uh, title was the seriousness with which the research and documentation process was also taken. For the city, it was important to be able to prove what degree of change they could go through, how, what does success mean, or where are the challenges, and what uh, the authorities decided to do was to appoint uh, the universities. So again, I had the, the fortune or the privilege uh, to be appointed the director of this program, the Impact 08 program, that was a collaboration between the University of Liverpool and Liverpool John Morse. And what we pushed for was precisely what I was arguing at the start of this talk. The fact that in order to capture the impact of a large scale intervention, we should not only be looking into numbers, we should not only be looking into its economic dimension, which is of course very important, but also do interrogate and advance methodologies to understand the impact on, on vibrancy and cultural vibrancy, on engagement, on image and perceptions, and on governance. So again, fascinating how uh, the year turned out, many challenges in terms of narrative developments, many controversies uh, and concerns leading to 2008, something that is common to the mega event experience, but also a moment of an opening ceremony, something that is, it was not very usual uh, within European capitals of culture at the time, but that Liverpool delivered in a very well achieved way and that completely turned around the narrative and generated uh, voluminous amounts of coverage of a very positive nature during the year, not just in the UK, but also importantly uh, from an international point of view. So again, we have kept observing how um, this experience has evolved, how it is remembered, and of course how it goes alongside the ongoing challenges in terms of economic transformation. But again, as in the case of uh, Barcelona, as in the case of uh, Sydney, this event was also happening alongside uh, many uh, developments that had to do with the urban transformation of the city. It all coincided and it resulted into a very powerful moment uh, of what could be considered this idea of the of a renaissance, the renaissance of the narratives around Liverpool. So the big impact and the big transformation for the city was the recovery or the, the reconstruction of a city centre with the opening up of what is now called the Liverpool One space and uh, the establishment of an arena and convention centre. Again, all the plans were preceding the European capital of culture moment but the coincidence and the alignment of timings uh, was important for the narrative developments. I would, like, I would like to jump a bit through the next uh, slides. I was going to speak about uh, London uh, briefly, but many of the lines that I had uh, were similar to what I have argued uh, earlier. Um, I want to have time to go into the second part of, of the talk and not steal too many minutes from our panel discussion. In the case of London, what was uh, interesting when hosting the 2012 Olympics is that it's an actual world city that didn't have to present uh, a new narrative in the same way as Barcelona did, or many of the other cities preceding it, uh, Beijing, Athens, Sydney, they were all cities that had a story to tell, something to present to the world that was not very well known. In the case of London, uh, the narrative and the, the notion of it being a world centre was very well established already. So the focus was on other 
levels of detail. And for instance, the, the kind of work and the advancements that were made uh, with, the, with the disability uh, arts movement, how it connected with the Paralympic Games is one of the memorable achievements. Uh, and the other big plan for the city, which was the transformation of its east uh, end, no? and uh, which has resulted into, well, still work uh, that is ongoing or what is now called the East Bank, uh, located within the Olympic Park. But I wanted to have a moment, and I will try to wrap it up very quickly, to talk as well about the way mega events have changed as a result of, of the cities hosting them. And here you have another image that I wonder whether you recognize from another uh, well-known opening uh, ceremony. Um, the period that I have described up till now is focusing on the last 40 years, but the mega event phenomenon actually gets explained if we look back into a far longer period of time that takes us back, sorry about this, into the mid 19th century with the establishment of, uh, again, the kinds of initiatives uh, such as uh, the World Fairs that are at the origin of what we now know as, as the, the World Expo, how they inspired the establishment of the modern Olympic Games that started in 1896, and obviously of other types of events in the arts world, uh, such as the, the Viennale di Venezia, no? that also started just along uh, the same uh, time as the Olympic Games. These are very, the very origins and are very much embedded with notions of, yes, bringing the world together, uh, having grand narratives around humanity and, and their hopes for the future. The World Cup actually started in 1930. So again, it has a, an interesting uh, history itself. But then we have the world wars, the two world wars also setting uh, a crack, a disruption. Uh, Olympic Games had to be cancelled uh, twice in that context. And after that, we have another moment of development with what we could consider mega events. They are in part also emerging as a result of, a, of this kind of war recovery. And what we have is also this idea of rebuilding a sense of, of identity, of pride, of hope for the future. It's the moment of the start of the Edinburgh International Festival. And I'm told that the fringe also has been there from the beginning as a, as a parallel to the, uh, to the official, what was supposed to be the official program at the time. So also fringe activities starting uh, in, in 1947. We have the Festival of Britain as a, an example of something inspired in part by the World Fair, but happening in a specific uh, national setting, again, to celebrate notions of going forward. Eurovision uh, started in 1956 uh, as also a way of setting up a conversation across uh, Europe through a song contest. And we have the Olympic Games evolving. So through the 50s, through the 60s, uh, and one of the examples that I always like to highlight is that of Mexico in 1968, because of the, the way it uh, set the way to advance ideas around, again, cultural representation, graphic design, ways of, of dressing the city, again, something that since then has been growing and taken for granted. But also it's a moment of upheaval, of social unrest. There was a lot of protest happening obviously all across the world in 1968. There was a lot of student uh, uprisals. There was some violence also preceding, just preceding the game. And we have this very powerful moment, not the, the black salute that actually happened in the actual podium uh, of the Mexico Olympics. So big questions around, you know, relationships, uh, the, the political, we have the Cold War, we have a whole context uh, putting into question again, how do we um, protect and are sensitive to these international gatherings? What is it that we are exposing? What is it that we can celebrate in a way uh, that feels uh, comfortable for everyone? Or how much actually we are disagreeing with each other, with each other and we need you know, more platforms to, to bring forward, no? the, the activism, the, the sense of protest or discontent. 
And we have uh, Montreal in 1976 with another example of, again, what could be seen as another area of cracks and, and big question marks, which was sustainability, which was cost. Uh, these are the games that have become known because of this notion of maybe bankrupting a city. No? So the, the idea is that Montreal took many decades to pay off the infrastructural developments that were put together for those games. So there was a halt, there was a big, big question marks they set up during the 1970s. Cities wondering whether it was feasible to attract mega events. And the big moment of change is from the 1980s onwards. That is where we have new models coming forward. Uh, the idea of, yes, selling uh, media rights, of establishing branding, of attracting sponsorship in order to make these events, well, uh, feasible and not implying such an enormous burden into the public purse exclusively. And we have plenty of other events also emerging and developing, especially we're talking now of the last uh, few decades. So it's a moment of media, uh, the big media event uh, moment, uh, taking the floor um, and is the moment of sponsorship, of, of branding, no? uh, something that the Olympics certainly mastered and became a point of reference for plenty of other events. The image that I had shown before was from Los Angeles from 1984 and Rocketman, and the big uh, line and claim uh, coinciding with this explosion of, of coverage and media coverage is that two billion people would be watching uh, simultaneously an opening ceremony. But again, in parallel to that, we have the big question marks and the discussions, the controversies that continue to this day and precede the COVID-19 crisis, which is cities that might think, actually, can we do? Can we keep, is this mega event model actually working? How are we saturating cities? Um, do we want this? Uh, are we creating, uh, you know, ghost towns on the back of this event? So I want to uh, wrap it up by saying that preceding uh, the pandemic, many of the questions around yeah, the sustainability of mega events were already there. And this year has been very interesting and valuable in order to put questions to the floor. So I'm very keen uh, to get the reactions from our panelists about all of this, different views about the power uh, the, the possibility, the optimism that a mega event can bring to a city. Uh, the examples I was discussing before with Barcelona, with Glasgow, with Liverpool, uh, being transformed, being seeing uh, new opportunities, an opportunity to change uh, the narrative, and also the concerns that continue, that are very different in part from what was emerging in the 1970s, um, but that are not completely uh, gone. So what is this year bringing to the fore that might help address the future if we believe that mega events are still necessary? And what might we see in Tokyo in 2020 is uh, going to be fascinating uh, because there is a determination uh, in the Japanese uh, authorities and also from the International Olympic Committee to make this edition of the games possible, uh, no matter what. There is a lot of thinking, a lot of debate around yeah, alternative forms of hosting, how to be safe, how to broadcast, how to present uh, events, how to generate euphoria. So yeah, what kinds of ceremonies, what kind of uh, moments of collective gathering might we be able to, to witness with these games? At the same time, there is concern. I keep seeing on social media some of the protests that are emerging in Japan, those that feel, well, this is not the year, this is not the time to host a mega event. So what do we think? How much do we need this moment? How much do we need actually precisely because of what has happened, a moment to come together and to think of reconstructing the world in ways that are similar to what happened after the, the world wars. Um, how essential is this? Uh, and again, how much are we going to need or are we going to be able to see that Olympic city uh, around the Tokyo Olympic Games 
uh, if indeed they happen. Again, one of the questions that you posed was whether I believe they will go ahead, and actually my answer is that yes, I believe they, they will. In, in one way or another, organizers will be figuring it out. So this is me. I would like, maybe just before we open up the discussion with the panelists, is to give you the chance to interact with us again. So we have two questions. And uh, I would like to ask Helen to share the, the screen again, the Mentimeter, so that you share with us, in this case, putting this other code, 82, 20, 45, and 4. Uh, in a few words, any of your biggest concerns about uh, mega events going forward. Let's see if we have any reactions from you. And then we will ask you about the other side of, uh, of the equation in terms of what you feel. Okay, so the consent security continues to be, because yes, I didn't have the chance to talk about the impact of 9-11, of uh, but very important for many years, how the, the security issue uh, was at the heart of, uh, of the concerns and the planning for mega events. Now we're talking about health, no, about the possibility for infections. We have other key questions, uh, key notions such as yet yeah, gentrification, uh, access, whether events like the Olympics may be usurping minor sports, I have seen. Um, expectation management is a, it's a very good point to raise. Sustainability continues to be one even if so much progress has been made in the last 20 years on that front, in terms of legacy planning within all mega events, um, how important now it has become from the big stage to, to plan for legacy. Cost continues to be a concern. And uh, yes, the issues around it, the social, the local impact, how much this is um, a big show, that has a, a global dimension, but might be a bit insensitive to local concerns. Let's go into the next uh, screen. That is to ask you about what should we prioritize if there is to be a positive future for mega event. And it is, my panel is what I'm asking them is yes, it's how much we need them and we can come back to that later. But let's see how much is actually similar questions Realistic costs, so the realism with planning, um, community, so yes, community growing, um, issues around the environment, health, and uh, here relevance, relevance to, to community. So again, the importance of that ongoing conversation with people, so that it's not just about the organizers, but also the different communities of interest. So yes, you see, and this is something that we will share with all of you when we have, in terms of those worlds, and legacy, the importance of, of legacy. And again, what is interesting uh, is to think that although those are terms that have become very common, we can never take them for granted. And in terms of the approach to delivery, actually legacy, what was meaningful, what was needed 20 or 30 years ago, might not be the same that we need now. So yes, we can end, thank you, the sharing. And I will simply um, give the, the floor to, to the panel. I will show you first, just briefly, their taste, but it's, yes, we're moving on and we're giving the, the floor, the virtual floor to, uh, to our Dean Peter Hughes to introduce our panelists. Thank you very much.